for about 6 million years, the Colorado River has carved its way through 2 billion years of Earth's history to produce the vast layer cake channels of the Grand Canyon. A consequence of the river's actions is the presence of caves, and a lot of them. Plenty of these caves provided refuge for Ice Age beasts and preserved whatever those beasts left behind. One of the rarest of these Grand Canyon mega beasts is a mysterious big cat that had scientists wrestling with its true identity for decades, until now. A bunch of big cat bones have been recovered from the Grand Canyon's various caves over the last hundred years, and past researchers thought they all belonged to an Ice Age puma. A new team of scientists reanalyzed the assorted bones to get a better confirmation on their identity. A team that included John Paul Hotnit, an expert in tenacanth sharks and Pleistocene big cats. Vincent Santucci, the senior paleontologist and paleontology program coordinator with the National Park Service, Richard White, Mary Carpenter, and Dr. Jim Mead. The caves, stashed with the Ice Age feline treasures, are called Next Door Cave, Stanton's Cave, and Rampart Cave. Next Door Cave isn't completely excavated or explored. It's actually not even a real cave. It's but a lip of sediment with the slightest suggestion of a cave. An ankle bone of a big cat was in that sediment, which was identified as an Ice Age puma in 2003. Unlike Next Door Cave, Stanton's Cave had a lot of work done in the 1960s and 70s. Among the remains of an Ice Age goat were the foot and toe bones from the left paw of another puma-like cat. What's wickedly cool about these bones is that it preserved the keratin sheath that covered the claw bone. Lastly, and certainly not leastly, is Rampart Cave. This cave is most well known for the bones, fur, and 20-foot thick layer of dung of the Shasta ground sloth. The cave was first excavated in 1936 by Civilian Conservation Corps workers. Proper study of the cave's fossils occurred in the late 1940s by Smithsonian researcher Remington Kellogg. Aside from the sloth stuff and the entire microhabitat found in the sloth stuff, two scattered bodies of big cats were also recovered from Rampart Cave. These remains were originally classified, yet again, as puma. The larger of the two cats was identified as a subadult based on the development of its two furs. The smaller cat, which had mummified flesh still attached to one of its toe bones, was determined to be a juvenile. J.P. Hotnet and Santucci's research team took a closer look at those cat bones and found something quite extraordinary. None of the cats from the three caves were actually pumas. The fossils belonged instead to the extinct American cheetah, which is known scientifically as Morassinonyx. The American cheetah is a bit of a misnomer. When it was first identified in the 1890s, it was thought to be an early predecessor to the modern puma. It does look an awful lot like it after all. Studies through the 1970s found connections between the American cheetah and the African cheetah. However, not every researcher agreed on exactly what the American cheetah was. Ideas on identity ping-ponged back and forth between a North American offshoot of the cheetah lineage to a cheetah look-alike related to the puma lineage. It's now generally considered more closely related to the puma than to the true cheetah, but exactly how it is has yet to be fully settled. The redescribed remains were found in high elevation caves. This is completely outside the previously understood ecology of the American cheetah. In comparison, African cheetahs live on the savannas, open woodlands, and desert grasslands of northeast, southeast central, and southern Africa. They use their long, stilt-like legs and springy spines to race after prey over short distances. In most of the African cheetah's range, they prefer to hang out on high elevation mounds in wide open territories rather than mountainous, rocky ones. The Asiatic cheetah subspecies is quite different from the other cheetahs. It's heavily restricted to central Iran with a different ecology. 
The Asiatic cheetah enjoys mountainous terrain and foothill areas where dry steppe habitats are found. They prey primarily on tough, slow, mountainous ungulates like wild sheep and Persian ibex. This lines up better with the new ecology supposed by the redescribed American cheetah remains than anyone had thought. The research team also compared the American cheetah to the snow leopard. Both the snow leopard and African cheetah share a lot of similarities in their skeletons, but little in their outside anatomy. The snow leopard also prefers far more mountainous terrain and prey than even the highest elevation Asiatic cheetah. The American cheetah shows a mix of the puma, the African and Asiatic cheetahs, and a little bit of the snow leopard in its physiology, making the American cheetah its own unique critter that could vary its habitat and prey preferences. Does this mean it looked more like a cheetah or a puma? That remains unclear. Its skeleton seems to mix features from African cheetahs and the puma, but preferred an ecology similar to the Asiatic cheetah. It may have needed a thicker coat of fur to survive the harsh winters of the northernmost reaches of its range and the browns, whites, spots, or blotches required to blend in. Unfortunately, that's something only a mummified corpse could confirm. Imagine the scenario proposed by the cave's paleontological trinkets. After a successful mountain goat kill, a mother American cheetah takes the carcass back to the sloth cave she has marked as her territory. Waiting for her in the cave's relative safety are her cubs, only six months old. As the family treats themselves to the tough and mild flesh of the cud chewer, a lumbering oaf of a ground sloth shambles over to the cave, previously used by his kin for millennia. Though the floor of the cave is now made completely of sloth dung, the mother big cat has taken the cave as her own, and that alone has kept most invaders away. The sloth is not interested in starting a fight with a cheetah, as small as she is. He may stick around for a bit until his brain tells him to move on to catch some grub somewhere less crowded. This little microhabitat is one of many throughout this region, this great region of geological significance that will one day go by the name Grand Canyon National Park. Imagine what more lies beneath. This video is in collaboration with Vincent Santucci and J.P. Hotnet of the National Park Service Geologic Resource Division's Paleontology Program. I want to thank them for the opportunity and helping me edit the script for this video. If you want to learn more about this discovery and other finds from the Grand Canyon, I'll provide some National Parks links in the description and comment section below. If this video does well, more may follow, so make sure to like, comment, and subscribe.